Are you running the package? Are we live? I can't tell. No. Okay, we're live. We can be seen, we can be heard. I see us. <laughs> Yes, we are live. I can see us. I don't know if we can be heard. I hope we can be heard. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. We uh, appreciate it here. Obviously, uh, one of the joys of live streaming events. Uh, and thank you to uh, my guest for uh, for his patience. Uh, I think it so was that we, we you tried to start with that Alice Cooper clip and we got and the man shut us down. I, I guess. Let's just use I'm, that. I'm, I'm definitely not sure, but uh, let's turn it over to you and your talk. Uh, since I've taxed your time quite, quite a bit at this point, uh, I do appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, so to reintroduce him, Dr. William McBride is going to give his talk entitled The Rigid Embrace of the Narrow House, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So um, I, I, we had planned to start with um, the ballad of Dwight Fry, which, of course, is the actor who plays um, Renfield in the 1931 Todd Browning Dracula. And Alice Cooper, whose real name is Vincent Fournier, Fournier um, has that song. And there's a section where he's just saying, I want to get out of here. And so that to me hooked up with this talk about being buried alive. So in the capstone course for English majors here at ISU, I've called the current iter iteration of the senior seminar, Gothic Aesthetic as Cultural Metaphor. We've been trying to get at what defines the Gothic, what might explain its fascination and persistence. I trust you've been Netflixing, Netflixing lately and you know what I'm talking about. I don't know how people have time to binge watch all of these shows. And if you just are limiting yourself to the Gothic and the vampires. So my students on Thursday said, you have to watch Midnight Mass, which I know last night, Richard Chismar brought up uh, as well. And it's apparently great. And I'm looking for, I've served a Midnight Mass. That was a coup back in the day. But I, you know, I hope to get to that one. So in the class, we started in masks with Levinas writing about the face. And then we discussed Susan Sontag's reasons not to use illness as metaphor. And, you know, like vampirism is a metaphor for contagion, for COVID. I'm a vampire, I bite you. And then you test positive as a vampire and so on. And then you're locked down in your coffin, your apartment, in a sort of premature burial metaphor. Kristeva then approaches us, approached us with her theory of objection. Next, the preeminent authority on the Gothic, Professor Jerry Hogel, virtually, literally, zoomed in on us to answer our questions about the Gothic and his distinction between Gothic. We moved on to Nick Groom's wicked, informative intro to and our reading of Walpole's Castle of Otron. In terms of sort of a horror post-1970 certainly is definitely dependent upon that, right? That's where you get all your slashers are certainly from a, a dependence on the uncanny, right? Um, we can't have Michael Myers, for instance, without many iterations of the uncanny, uh, not least to William Shatner, right? Um, however, for me, I think the, the uh, spooky also implies a degree of the supernatural. And so I think what we, we see in terms of spooky and spookiness is that there, there's a legacy of um, almost like cultural heritage inherent in spookiness um, because of that dependency on the cult, supernatural and the idea of both superstition and faith. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily, by faith, I don't necessarily mean you have to be, one has to be religious, but one does have like traditions uh, that are embedded culturally uh, with cultural norms that can be impeded upon that can create this sort of sense of uh, spookiness uh, as almost like a retaliative, uh, retaliatory, excuse me, um, 
in relationship to it. And you believe in that sort of thing, right? Um, there's this also degree of like participation in those things that uh, makes you acquiesce to things you may not even believe in. For instance, why do you throw salt over your shoulder if you spill it? Right. We people do that without even knowing why. And the reason why is that Judas spills the salt at the table and it betrays that he's the one who's going to betray Jesus. But most people, you know, as an art historian, I find don't know that story. Um, when I teach, yeah, I love, I love the stuff. origins of all. I'm about origins, right? Why do you say bless you when someone sneezes? You know, we don't think about it. I mean, last night, uh, Richard, Richard Chismar said that something drove him batty. Yeah. And of course, you know, you think about vampires. So I, th I think that the, it's these traditions um, and the possible violation of these traditions and some unknown consequence that for me is where the core of spooky lives. Um, and so just uh, quickly, be, uh, so the slasher, uh, that's not uncanny for me. That's disturbing in other ways. But, <laughs> well, I meant the figure of the, the killer is an uncanny Oh, okay, figure. the mask. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So Poe seduces his readers with a similar question. He has his narrators ask, what is it? Why is the imp? Why is the usher house? Why is premature burial spooky? I'm quoting now. What was it? I paused to think. What was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the house of usher? So my claim is the terror delivered by being buried alive is more terrifying than the threats engineered by, say, those fictive supernatural vampires, evil space aliens, zombies, mummies, ghosts, you know, the ones who are preparing to ring your doorbell at the end of the month. Hopefully, they're preferably doubly masked. But honestly, tricksters wanting treats will not be dressed in any Ben Cooper prematurely buried human costume. And General Mills is not reporting any boxes of live bury all frosted coffins. I, I like that one coming out at this time. Coffin, vault, stone tomb, sepulcher, prison, straight jacket. I'm trapped, helpless, can't move, suffocated, immobilized, a basket case, drowned. For the narrator of premature burial, this claust his claustration is the most intense of pleasurable pain, and he is lost in reveries of death. So what makes live burial distinct from other sources of terror? I think part of it is the injustice of the thing. Hey, I'm not dead, you know. It's a version of the wrong man syndrome, often thematized by Hitchcock most notably in his 1935 nine film of the same name. I didn't do the crime, but here I'm locked up in solitary confinement doing the time. I'm in prison in like a jail-like coffin. I shudder at the coffin-like straitjacket. We're talking about claustration and about claustrophobia. This is a fear of the lack of control of one's environment. And I didn't have to look that one up. And because gothic events such as these are often plain, painfully pleasurable, pleasurably painful experiences, we don't have to dig too far below the surface to find a claustrated, snug as a bug in a rug masochism and attendant bondage at work, which I'll get back to with the help of Gil Deleuze. So I'm supported by Poe's narrator who explains that being buried alive is the true terror because it's true. Unlike all the other bugaboo tales, it may be asserted without hesitation that no event is so terribly well adapted to inspire the supremeness of bodily and mental distress as his burial before death. The unendurable oppression of the lungs, the stifling fumes from the damp earth, the clinging of the death garments, the rigid embrace of the narrow house, the black it, blackness of the absolute night, the silence like a sea that overwhelms, the unseen but palpable presence of the conquering worm. These things, with the thoughts of the air and grass above, with memory of dear friends who would fly to save us if but informed of our fate, and with consciousness that of this fate they can never be informed, 
that our hopeless portion is that of the really dead. These considerations, I say, carry into the heart, which still palpitates a degree of appalling and intolerable horror from which the most daring imagination must recoil. We know of nothing so agonizing upon earth. We can dream of nothing half so hideous in the realms of the nethermost hell. And thus, all narratives upon this topic have an interest profound, an interest nevertheless which, through the sacred awe of the topic itself, very properly, very peculiarly, depends on our conviction of the truth of the matter narrated. It's the spookiest terror because it's real. It's true. Last night's speaker, Richard Chismar, said the nonfiction account of Ted Bundy was the most terrifying read for him. Being buried alive happens for real. It can happen to you even if you don't believe in spooks. Incidentally, there's an historical, cultural, critical uh, critique of that word that we can do some other time. Here's the narrator again. There are certain themes of which the interest is all absorbing, but which are too entirely horrible for the purposes of legitimate fiction. They are with propriety handled only when the severity and majesty of truth sanctify and sustain them. In these accounts, it is the fact, it is the reality, it is the history which excites. The sacred awe of the topic itself very properly depends on the truth of the matter. Then, like the narrator of uh, the Imp of the Perverse, who for the first part of that text and this one seems to be reporting on his topic, but then comes the bombshell. What I have now to tell you is of my own actual knowledge, of my own positive and personal experience, of being buried alive. So it can really happen. In fact, it happened to me. And it's in the first person. We're promised the real experience of the genuinely spooky. But spoiler alert, if you haven't read Premature Burial, the real truth is that the coffin he's clawing at, that we're thrilling at, turns out to be a boat that he finds himself on as he's recovering from his cataleptic seizure. Uh, we thought he was, um, you know, buried. The story's been a lie. In most cases, like Miss Madeline Usher's, the subject suffers from catalepsy, are mistaken for dead, and then buried alive. In a 1980 Hastings Center report entitled, like mine, The Rigid Embrace of the Narrow House, but he goes on to subtitle it, Premature Burial and the Signs of Death, Mark Alexander chronicles the 18th and early 19th century mistrust of medical science the uncertainty of the verification of death that fed the premature burial fear. And folks like Madeline Usher are buried quickly to prevent eth unethical doctors from stealing cadavers from their research, for their research. And here's a spoiler alert. This is the linchpin of Roger Corman's premature burial plot, which I hope we can show some. Poe's narrator describes his seizure. I sank little by little into a condition of semi-syncope or half swoon. And in this condition without pain, without ability to stir or strictly speaking to think, but with a dull lethargic consciousness of life and of the presence of those who surrounded my bed, I remained until the crisis of the disease restored me suddenly to perfect sensation. At other times I was quickly and impetuously smitten I grew sick and numb and chilly and dizzy and so felt prostrate at once. Then for weeks, all was void and black and silent while the closest scrutiny and the most rigorous medical tests failed to establish any material distinction between the state of the sufferer and what we conceive of as absolute death. I'm going to do the biographical fallacy now. As a sufferer of epileptic seizures, Poe may have transposed the, his obsessive fear of wrongful burial as a result of catalepsy. And as a side note, um, uh, the list of famous brilliant sufferers of this sacred disease is mind-boggling. 
in the falling sickness, a history of epilepsy from the Greeks to the beginning of modern neurology uh, from the John Hopkins Press um, book. Uh, neurologist John Hughes lists, and here comes like a Billy Joel bad, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, St. Paul, remember his splinter on the, in the flesh on the road to Damascus is an epileptic seizure. Joan of Arc, Martin Luther, hence it's known as the sacred disease. Dante, Dickens, Byron, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, Handel, Gershwin, Neil Young, Prince, Adam Horowitz of the Beastie Boys, and Lil Wayne just apparently came out of the closet as an epileptic. And yes, Poe abused drugs and alcohol. So these could be chalked up to, to withdrawal, but he experienced seizure, seizures nonetheless. So these seizures can be cataleptic and epileptic, can be transcendent realms. And they're described by monks, nuns, yogis, Sufis, saints, sages, and mystics who are all characterized by emotionlessness, a stillness. Anchorites and other spiritual hermits had themselves immured, subsisting on minimal food and water. One of St. Jerome's acolytes spent his entire life in a well, in a cistern, living on figs, apparently five a day. All but one of Poe's wrongful interment stories are told from the outside, either from an observer or a victimizer. Montresor walls up a living, breathing Fortunato in a niche in the cask of Amontillado. The narrator tells us of Madeline Usher's live burial and the black cat narrator walls up a living, breathing cat by mistake and his mutilated wife on purpose. So it's the outside, right? But it's, it's really only a first person narrative of being alive, of being buried alive that can deliver direct shudderings. In, and I'm, we're queuing up Roger Corman. In Roger Corman's 1962 adaptation of the Poe story, we get to experience firsthand, interior monologue and all, the burial of the British aristocrat Guy Carell, the stand-in for Poe's narrator. Let's see. I suppose, after the reading of the will. Why should you say that? No reason. I merely thought that under the circumstances, you might find this house rather disturbing. To your conscience, I mean. Kate, are you implying that Emily isn't anywhere responsible for Guy's death? No one is responsible. He died of a heart attack induced by shock. Don't you understand? Yes, I understand. The fact is, he brought on the shock himself episode in the crypt and all the others, they were planned, contrived. Don't you see? Planned? By whom? By Guy himself. In a strange way, he wanted to die. Stop talking about him! Stop talking about him! That 
It's a bit much, Mr. Sweeney. What is, Mr. Moore? The old gentleman sending us out here to dig up this one. I mean, his own son-in-law. Well, one skiff's pretty much like another. Oh, we struck wood. Now, where's the bloody crowbar? I, I believe I left it up on top. Well, Mr. Moore, would you do me the kindness to fetch a dune? If I will, Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Sweeney? No. 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 I never did nothing to you. Please. Please. I never did nothing to you. Please. And we're back. Okay. Um... Corman's two screenwriters here are Charles Beaumont, the idol of Dean Koontz, and Ray Russell, the guy Stephen King swears by. And by the way, Corman's movie was shot by cinematographer Floyd Crosby, the dad of David Crosby of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. In 1955, for the first season of his TV series, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Hitchcock himself directs Breakdown. It's his writer's mid 20th century version of premature burial shot by psychos director of photography, John L. Russell, Russell Jr. The television play was written by Francis Cockrell and Lewis Pollock from a story Pollock published in 1947. It turned out to be one of his last projects. He was wrongfully blacklisted by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Lewis Pollock was mistaken for a man of the same name who had refused to answer questions posed by the committee. His script preceded, this script preceded his banishment by less than a year, and it lends an uncanny and terrifying irony by predicting the wrong burial of his, um, of his living career. And so the episode opens with successful businessman William Kalu, Joseph Cotton, doing business poolside in Miami Beach, on the phone, firing a man who pleads for his job. Kalu hangs up on him because the dumped employee starts to cry. A man crying to another man in 1955. Driving back up to New York, he has a car accident that rams the steering wheel up under his chin, paralyzing him. And like Poe's cataleptics, he's mistaken for dead. And here's the final scene in the morgue. We roll it. Emily. Where is he? There. He started building it a month ago. Please open the door. Emily, didn't you understand me? I said I... I don't it's okay. think it's going. I don't think it's rolling. Hello, Miles. I'm glad to see you. I must apologize. I was very rude. Yes, Guy. You were very rude. You see, I've been quite ill. So I understand. Guy, I have brought Miles along to see if he can help you. Well, that's very solicitous, but quite unnecessary. I'm helping myself now. How, Guy? How? Come inside, I'll show you.
This is it. My grand plan. What should it be? Some liqueur, brandy, amontillado? Guy, I brought... Now let us drink to something appropriate. To death. Not drinking, but a pity. It's really quite good. Guy. Yes, my dear? You wish to say something? No. Well, in that case, let me tell you about my latest edition. I thought of it the night before last. Of course, it's highly unlikely I shall ever use it, but one never knows, does one? It permits of easy egress and is completely impassable from the outside. A simple arrangement, I grant, but effective. Guy, this is madness. Madness? It's the only sane answer to my problem. I'll show you just how mad I am. I suppose she's told you my father was a cataleptic. No, but that doesn't mean that... I'm prone to the same affliction. Very well. Let us consider the following. Now, apropos of nothing at all, I have an attack. Let us say it happens during dinner. Emily sends Judson to fetch a doctor. The doctor arrives, he examines me and pronounces me dead. I am, of course, alive. You know the nature of catalepsy. But to the rest of the world, I'm gone. Passed on. Deceased. So a funeral is held, and I'm brought down here to this vault and placed in this coffin. Mourners have departed, the doors are both locked, and I'm alone. Now pay close attention. Now, the slightest movement of my finger caused that to happen. I am now free of the casket. But I'm still capable of only slight effort. So. But, you say, supposing no one hears the bell, the departing mourners lock both the doors. Supposing no one hears the bell, the departing mourners lock both the doors. And we're back. Are you going to take it briefly? Okay, so um, that wasn't the Hitchcock, uh, and that's fine. Uh, we can go on. So I really recommend looking at that episode. It's on YouTube, sort of like we are, and um, it's terrific. So Hitchcock, so here is this um, claustrated man, and he is on a gurney, and he has a sheet over him, and he, we get his internal monologue uh, as well just like we got um, uh, this guy, uh, Ray Lands, And that's what I'm saying is uh, the uh, a special. Most of them are told from the third person. Uh, Hitchcock has already given us Rear Window with Jimmy Stewart as L.B. Jeffries bound in a wheelchair. And Vertigo with Scotty Ferguson gripped by a sickness and ending up in a catatonic state also bound in a wheelchair. And I think of Madeline Daniels, um, Melanie Daniels, uh, uh, claustrated in that phone booth. Breakdown, the episode you didn't see, that's okay. Breakdown gives us a very satisfying wrap up where the cold heart melts. And so I often ask my students to consider in narratives what happens the next day once you close the book or the curtain or the film ends. So in this case, this hard ass guy who fires this man because he was already gonna fire him, but he hangs up on him because he's crying. Will the guy he fired get his job back now that he has been saved? What we didn't wait. So the way the piece ends is he cries. So the coroner sees tears coming down this cadaver's face and realizes Joseph Cotton's alive. So that's that uncanny moment. 
That's the, um, but it's also heartwarming. Um, and it ends, you know, all's well that ends well. And that's, for me, kind of annoying. Uh, it's the same with, uh, um, with the ending of Premature Burial. He's not really buried alive. It's a dream, you know? It's the Wizard of Oz. It's, it wasn't the great flying monkeys and so on. That was just a dream. and None of it's real. And that's annoying to me because that, you know, takes it all away. That takes away the power. How you're going to tell a story about premature burial from the first person is another question we could, we could work on. Some sort of. Um, so anyway, um, we're let off the hook. And that undermines the true terror. We never see the wrongful burial through to its end. It would take some kind of clever um, device or other to give us that story. Perhaps a transition to some omniscient narrator to step in. In the Corman film of Poe, Guy Carell managed to get out of his coffin. We saw this. Kill the grave robber. Kill the father-in-law doctor who allowed his own son-in-law to be buried so he could claim the live body that night for medical research. Kalu, Joseph Cotton, gets to throw, oh, sorry, no, not Kalu, uh, Guy Carell gets to throw his conniving wife alive into his fresh, twice dug grave, who was hoping to help her father secure a living corpse to assume all of Carell's wealth. And because two wrongs can't make a right, he gets shot too by his colleague, Miles Archer, who Carell's wife, Emily, has been hitting on. So there's some gothic soap opera for you, but it ends all, you know, it ends well, except for you can't murder. So that gets um, murdered as well. So nearly all wrongly interred gothic characters are wealthy, starting with the castle of Toronto, where the rightful heir Theodore is buried under a enormous helmet for a while. Roderick and Madeline Usher live in a mansion and end up like buried treasure since there is no heir. The wealthy can afford to live in fear of premature burial. The working poor haven't the luxury. Fear of being buried alive is bourgeois fear. The working poor haven't that luxury. Fear of being alive is... Note the role of the grave diggers in the Corman film. Do they have the luxury to fear about these, to worry about these things, to indulge in the imp of the perverse? The time and money to construct their fancy casket as a means of escape. You know, while those who were literate did read these tales of the rich and the famous, they were never important, important characters in any of the stories. They were never depicted carrying these fears. So the attraction for them, perhaps, was that they may be picturing these powerful people getting their comeuppance. Look at these people, they think too much. One of the main engines of a Toronto and Usher and Corman's film is inheritance of vast estates. It's about contracts and property rights. Witness the very wealthy Count Dracula's interest in Carfax Abbey. And going way back, in chapter 16 of Numbers, Yahweh tells Moses that he's burying alive Aaron and his crew, throwing them into the pit and everything they own with them. The earth close, closes over them and they die and are gone from the community. They are swallowed up. There may be a subterranean thrill from being swallowed up, disappearing in quicksand. There's more claustration in the Bible and some other time we can talk about Jesus' burial. But I want to talk about clefts, C-L-E-F-T-S. Moses is dying to see Yahweh's face. On a side note, there's a great gospel inflected song on the Stones uh, album, Exile on Main Street, called I Just Want to See His Face. Moses pleads with Yahweh, saying, look, after all, this is a paraphrase, after all I've done for you, carrying out your orders, the least you can do is let me see your face. Yahweh relents, sort of. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, I will put thee in a cleft in the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And once past Moses, uh, once he gets past Moses, Yahweh uh, lifts his hand and his hind parts are revealed. And I'm not kidding. 
So anyway, in Shakespeare, so I'm talking about these clefts, these, these being claustrated, you know, coffin, cleft in a rock. In Shakespeare's The Tempest, when Prospero gets to the island, he discovers Sycorax has claustrated the sprite Ariel in a pine. And Prospero uses that imprisonment on Ariel to do his magic bidding. Prospero also goes on to claustrate Caliban in stone. In this fall's drama class, just this week, we read and watched A Streetcar Named Desire, witnessing the gothic and vampiric vibe of Blanche, the wounded femme fatale and English teacher, and the self-described tarantula. She tells Mitch, however, I thank God for you because you seem to be gentle, a cleft in the rock of the world I could hide in. And when she sees her sister's ruinous, creepy apartment in New Orleans, she says, quote, never, never, never in my worst dreams could I picture. Only Poe, only Mr. Edgar Allan Poe could do it justice. Out there, I suppose, is the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. Oh, those English teachers. There's a libidinal economy that funds claustration in the masochistic desire to be bound up. Hamlet, the privileged prince and goth student in masochistic desire. Sorry, uh, I reread. Okay, Hamlet, the privileged prince and goth student, all dressed up in black and home from the University of Wittenberg, to attend his dad's funeral and his mom's wedding to his uncle, we're getting some more soap opera, reveals to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, quote, oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. And speaking of academics, intrigued by claustration, there's this professor of mathematics and history at the University of Graz, who writes Venus impels in furs. None other than Leopold van Sacker Massot, who like Marquis de Sade, unwitting, unwittingly lends his name to a pathology. Massot writes a story about a wealthy, no surprise, Austrian nobleman named Severin von Kuziemski. While in his essay, Coldness and Cruelty, Gil Deleuze argues that Severin, the masochistic male subject, is impersonating his father in order to humiliate him, I read the role of Wanda, the dominatrix, who let's not forget is recruited by the submissive male who's really in charge. Uh, he recruits her to impersonate the mother, a stern one, no doubt, who claustrates the wealthy and powerful man by day with ropes and within a vault in the cellar. And because fabulously wealthy herself, Wanda can summon her three elder slender black servants, servant girls, like Dracula's three brides who overwhelmed Jonathan to his paralyzed delight, to throw him to the ground. They throw him to the ground, Severin, tie his hands and feet and secure, quote, my arms behind me like a man about to be executed. I could hardly move an inch. They drag him to the cellar where they flung me into a dark vault a veritable, veritable prison cell. The door closed behind me. The bolt was shot and the key ground in the lock. I was buried alive. And loving it, to invoke Mel Brooks. It's Poe's story. In Poe's story, the narrator encounters an invisible fiend who acts and talks very much like a scolding maternal dominatrix. Quote, Methought I, me thought I was immersed in a cataleptic trance of more than unusual duration and profundity. Suddenly there came an icy hand upon my forehead and an impatient gibbering voice whispered the word arise within my ear. The cold hand grasped me fiercely by the wrist, shaking it petulantly while the gibbering voice said again, arise. Did I not bid you arise? Get thee up. Come with me into the outer night and let me unfold to thee the graves. I looked and the unseen figure, which still grasped me by the wrist again, said to me as I gazed, is it not, oh, is it not a pitiful sight? Uh, I'm going to cut this. But he, he, uh, this, this, this 
dominatrix, we don't know the gender, opens up the graves and it's a great light show. And I recommend um, premature burial. In Ivan Goncharov's 1859 novel about a recumbent slacker named Oblomov, who it takes a hundred pages for him to get out of bed, we hear his stern butch friend Stoltz upbraid him, gravely warning that Olga, the angel from who, for whom Oblomov is intended, cannot lift him out of the swamp, saying, I am voicing not only my own wish, but also that of Olga, for she desires you not to perish utterly, not to be buried alive. She desires that at least I make an attempt to dig you up from the tomb. The masochist fantasizes about being claustrated. Wanda is the mother, mother who swaddles Severin. He's cradled. He luxuriates in his cocoon, in the nutshell. And simultaneously, he's being punished. And maybe it's no surprise where we're headed. In his essay, The Uncanny, Freud writes, too many people, excuse me, to many people, the idea of being buried alive while appearing to be dead is the most uncanny thing of all. And yet psychoanalysis has taught us that this terrifying fantasy is only a transformation of another fantasy, which had originally nothing terrifying about it at all, but was filled, filled with a certain lustful pleasure. The fantasy, I mean, of intrauterine existence. So our rat terrier, Phoebe, noses her way under a blanket and expertly wraps herself around, ingeniously stepping on part of the bottom of the blanket, revolving herself until she is as snug as a bug in a rug. Most of us humans say it's because she was taken away from her mother too soon. And what do we do with a newborn? We swaddle the newborn. We wrap the newborn up to maybe the transition from that womb. And maybe we're getting that echo with this premature burial and this claustration. In an odd, delicious, delicious scene, which you've already seen, uh, early on in Corman's premature uh, burial, uh, you can see some of the pleasure inherent in this pain. Guy Carell proudly demonstrates all of the devices he's developed to save him from being mistakenly buried alive. And I hope you saw as he excitedly got into his purple, softly rather than rigidly padded coffin. And he grins ear to ear as he gleefully lowers the heavy lid. He sort of minces a little bit. So we play that clip and we're back. For Blanche Dubois, there's a hope for a cozy Gamutlikite, cozy feel to being embraced by Mitch within that cleft that he could provide, preferably a tight, rigid embrace. But the terrifying end of that play, after a drunken man rapes his sister-in-law while his wife is having their baby, is that the heartbreakingly gentle English school teacher has a straight jacket waiting for her as the curtain falls. That's what I have. I've got some other things to talk, you know, questions and things, but um, that's the paper. And that's, and I want to thank you for pushing me to work on this because I'm going to do more with this. And just reading it out loud, you, you know, as you know, Matthew, you get to see what's working and what's not. So I, I have a couple of just notes I made. So, uh, or deviations where my mind went. So if, if you'll indulge me there, I'd like to get into a couple of them um i might go backwards here when you were talking about soccer masak um another uh play came to mind uh jean genet's the balcony uh comes to mind uh with sort of the performativity of the bourgeois and the ne necessity of the other to confine the person particularly the judge uh in the yeah. balcony well i mean so you'll see these folks of power being restrained. Um, I think it's um, is it Ken Russell's 
I think it's Ken Russell's The Devils, where there's a there's a judge who is being whipped. He's mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know often that's the case. So you know that's that's Deleuze's argument that it's the powerful who are um, in control of folks all day. So at night they pay someone to you know they they let go of that power. You know they don't have you know it's a burden for them, but also. He argues that it's a hatred of their father and that that's being beaten um, out of them. They're humiliating their father. And now, you know, maybe that's kind of, you know, twisted logic, um, uh, you know, welcome to Freud and, and Gil Deleuze. But it does seem to have some some explanatory power of um, the inter interuterine fantasy. Uh, he, he's got me there. I, I like, I, I think that's, there's something going. And, and, you know, my dog Phoebe makes it, it proves the point. Sure. Um, it's interesting too, because there's like a legacy here in some ways, it's a, almost an inversion of the archetypes that come out of the Comida dell'arte, right? With the, uh, either the Doctore character um, and its relationship to, well, it's like the relationship to Columbina, right? Uh, in, in Comedia, just how the, um, it's the comic iteration of it, which we were talking a little bit about this too. If you see too much of the villainous iteration, it becomes comic, right? Yeah. Um, and that's the same thing I think that happens here in its own way, right? That if the scene is inverted, it becomes comedic. Right, like what you were saying, if we saw Dra Count Dracula making a chicken for to serve to Jonathan Harker. Yeah, that, that's a, I like that one. Also last night, uh, you and um, your guests were talking about watching Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein sure. and how it's funny, but it's also, he's right. It's frightening. I mean, depending on how old you are, but there are those moments where it gets creepy all of a sudden. And Lou, Lou Costello isn't going, wow, you know, uh, he's just afraid. Who was it? Um, God, I'm blanking on the name. Somebody wrote the play handbag, which is about, the handbag from the importance of being earnest and Mrs. Oh. prism is actually like a child murderer putting <laughs> babies course. in handbags and that's what she does yeah no uh, any so kind yeah. of riff like that is great yeah yeah uh carol churchill that's who it is oh carol, carol churchill mad forest and uh uh something girls uh yeah that's not gonna come to me yeah like the gilmore girls um <laughs> yeah and so but there's also that's a question i had uh is does does goth have a sense of humor? It does, because if you think what Lady Bracknell says, I've never met a person who was born, or at any rate, bred in a, in a parcel, right? Right, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going back to Poe. Oh, sure. And, and so I think that when you read Premature Burial, and most of his, there's some tongue-in-cheek. Mm -hmm. He kind of overdoes it. Uh, I think, I mean, look, I mean, if I can see it being tongue in cheek and over overdoing it it's probably there um and uh so i think he's a little um you know tongue in cheek i think i think that you can read premature burial as you know both gruesome and funny it is interesting because i mean you did the um the reveal about sort of like clawing at the ship too and i was thinking the relationship to like drowning stories oh yeah in all of this as well yeah i mean uh, you mentioned this last night too about quicksand it doesn't really exist i asked my students see they were like yeah it, i mean you know it exists and um but the idea of sinking alive and sinking and sinking and trying to breathe through sand and then you're done i mean uh i don't want to dwell too much into suicide but if you I, the end of the awakening kate chopin's uh novel the sort of first the new wave uh first wave feminism where the main character keeps swimming out into the ocean until she can no more and you have to think about each each stroke you have to recommit yourself to that act and uh i mean Although I don't like her for abandoning her children, but the um, the will to do that is frightening to me. Uh, that you 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 asked um, Richard last night what scared him or what 
what film or, or what, then that's something uh, I, I was preparing for this question. And so the last real horror film I saw that scared me because I avoid them all. I mean, I, I lasted, you're talking about slashers. I lasted five minutes in um, uh, whatever that show is. Everybody talks about uh, anyway. Uh, okay. That, I'll, I'll skip that one. The one I saw back in 1999 was the Blair Witch Project. That scared me. I was in a theater and it's a dark theater. It's a, they made sure it was a very dark theater. And you're seeing this kind of docu, you know, I, mean, I know it kind of spawned that docu um, uh, 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 feel. It's these girls, as you know. And when their camera drops and you can just hear the audio and everything's black and you know there's some nasty murderer out there. I didn't care for that because I felt claustrophobic. I, I didn't have any, I wasn't, I couldn't organize and control my environment. Um, yeah, I was thrust into that and I, 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 that scared me. Is that really the eye again? You shouldn't, that broadcast, that? you shouldn't broadcast the things that scare you. <laughs> you know, somebody's going to lock my office door. I won't be able to get out. Is that the eye though that you're talking about at the beginning of your talk too though? Because like you become the camera at that point. So you too have like this participatory sense. Oh, nice. I mean, because that, that, that's really, I mean, you get that a lot in, in particularly in filmic horror, right? You, you get put in sort of like situations. Like at one point you're in the back seat of the car that Michael Myers is driving in Halloween. Oh. Um, so you, you completely change perspectives from like omniscient to culpable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, yeah, that I mean, my knowledge of gothic literature is probably not strong enough to know if that is a thing that like narratively works or happens in literature where your perspective shifts huh. sort of like a they to an I or a we. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, a we or an it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I couldn't think of the name of the short story, but a guy bounds himself inside of a chair. Oh, by the way, yeah. Games of Thrones is the is the show I was trying ah. to think of that I have watched five minutes of, and there was no dialogue. There was just brutal brutality, unrelieved. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't need that. I know it's a great show, apparently, and everyone <laughs> swears by it, and, and so on. But um, anyway, you were talking. I'm going to look this up for you because the guy bounds himself in a chair. He like has the chair built around him. So oh, to have yeah. this experience of this woman sitting on him oh gee yeah and so it's like <laughs> the inverse of what you were talking about in some ways because he, he the only way he can have these like physical contact experiences is um by doing this because he's like repellent and things and the creepiest part about the whole thing is we find out that the entire story is actually his confession letter he's left for her oh. at the end <laughs> That he's been doing because this. he's killed her no he just he's been her favorite chair for years <laughs> yeah and like he's oh yeah he's you finally, gotta give me that they gotta give me that right yeah now. it's it's so distressing by the end because you're just like oh my god that's funny because <laughs> you realize it's that narrative shift right it's you you realize you're not him anymore you're her reading oh yeah that's confession that's uncanny yeah yeah yeah, and that's I, nice. Yeah, I've, I've got to find that for you because that, that kept popping up into my mind in, in terms of uh, some of what you're talking about here. Um, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more too on the idea of uh, the wrongfully accused yeah. um, as a type of burial because I thought that was a really interesting point. No. Yeah. Oh, I um, mean, uh, it, yeah, go ahead, please. Well, you, you gave uh, an anecdote that was very apt, obviously, in terms of uh, the, the, the film you talk about things. Um, but it is, an, it is an interesting device that does pop up quite frequently in stories. Um, and, and the idea of like how that just, the, the linguistics of almost being buried alive, right? And how one feels. You're thinking of something, tell me. Well, I mean... There's a couple different things I'm thinking. About. I mean, I'm thinking about like historical wrongfully accused, and I'm also like uh, Mamet Soliana comes to mind. Mm. Um, 
but I mean, it, it's not an uncommon device, right? And it's it's interesting because it disidentifies the person. Hmm. Um, it you know even in uh, doubt, right? The, the, the play doubt uh, when he gives the sermon about like um, rumors being like feathers and a pillow being scattered about, right? You see a disidentification hmm. of the person because it doesn't matter anymore because the rumor of the wrongfully accused is what becomes the actual narrative of the person. Oh. And so it's this complete loss of identity, even to oneself in some cases. Yeah. I mean, there, uh, it's just so disturbing to be accused of something that you haven't done. And you can see the dra- the dramatic possibilities there. Right. I mean, the, the clay, you know, if, if drama is about two forces uh, smashing into each other, and then the pathetic, pathetic I mean, the, the scream of someone being walled up, you know, uh, please, no, you know, being taken away in a straitjacket, uh, whether they're guilty. I mean, you know, Renfield, he's in a straitjacket. I mean, Seward lets him out, but um, that's, that's some of the horror for me. And okay. as I was trying to say at the beginning, and taking taking Poe's cue that vampires and ghosts and witches and all of that, um, to a certain extent, those are the kids that show up. They can show up on your front porch uh, on Halloween. But this, I mean, maybe you'll get somebody showing up in a straight jacket. I mean, it's kind of hard to take your candy. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, the buried alive and walled up in a wall that can happen. I mean, as you were um, saying of, about what you find spooky and that there's, a, there's an importance of belief, right? And last night you talked about X-Files and I want to believe it's out there, it's real, so on. Um, but that's a leap. And there is no leaping necessary in being buried alive. It's happened. Right. And so that's terrifying, at least oh, sure. Saying, Poe saying that's the most terrifying. And look at I'm Poe, you know. I mean, I should know. Yeah, I mean, and he he does do the. I mean, the sort of iteration of again this buried alive while active and present too. Like if you think of the Telltale Heart uh, as well, right? It's almost a, again one of these inversions where the person who is capable of being up and moving around can't be. <laughs> because they need to be in proximity. I mean, uh, you were talking about gothic soap opera. Of course, my favorite is Dark Shadows. Oh, gosh. Uh, You know, the first, I don't know, 400 episodes are dependent (laughs) upon her having buried her husband in the basement. That was on every five days a week, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, talk about slow. (laughs) I I maybe watched that like three times. I mean, it was, I think I was doing other things. But yeah, Barnabas Jones, no. uh, Collins. Collins, yeah, yeah, I can still see him, yeah, in my mind, yeah. But like the the matriarch of that family refuses to leave the home because she buried her husband alive in the in the basement. Oh, I'm glad we're um, recording this. I can go back and take take my notes. <laughs> the, the bibliography that comes yeah. out of these, yeah. Um, but that you know, so it is a reoccurring uh, sort, sort sort of thing. And uh, you know, you, you put it in, in the category of the gothic, and I, I I have to ask you because there's like I don't know if you're aware, there's definitely like a uh, Hatfield and McCoy relationship between horror and the gothic. Oh, uh, in terms of like using those terms or. Uh, misusing I guess and I I'm not too familiar I've just heard tales uh, so I wanted to, I wanted to get your uh, your opinion on that because I, I I still don't understand the feud myself well, I mean what I love is the Hatfield and McCoy because I'm now thinking of gothic things that happen in New England and then the southern gothic you know how those are yeah. distinct in a certain way um, I don't know if Jerry Hogel is is watching and if he's texting if he's chat commenting chatting but um he's got a distinction that maybe helps and that is the distinction between gothic terror and gothic horror sure and gothic horror as i understand it is the slashing is the body and gothic terror is this sort of internal 
skull business. And I may be getting this wrong, but I, I think it, I think that's right. I don't know if that helps. But no, I, I'm always curious what different people's takes on a concept are. So my so the gothic horror does not interest me. The the stabbing and the bleeding and the hey, you know, I, I don't need that. But the mind game, you know, the burying alive, it's disturbing, but I'll watch that because there's no blood and it's a mind game. It's a mind game, let's call it. Um, and those intrigue me. But the other, the horror stuff that, you know, I, I suspect, you know, I mean, the vampire, that's got both sort of, doesn't it? I mean, it's got sure. blood. It's got the, I mean, vampires are not buried alive, right? They die, then they're buried. Right. And then they and they are claustrated. They're claustrated during the day. They can't get well, out. Actually, I mean, Dracula sleeps above, like he just sleeps in the dirt. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Nosferatu's in a coffin. Well, actually, yeah. he put in, yeah, in Todd Browning, yeah, he's in a coffin. Right, right, right. And uh Nosferatu, and then that, that coffin gets busted open and he's oh yeah. Um, but what I love about that is I mean what go too far but um the undead so that's a mind game because you're not alive you're not dead you're this impossible linguistic structure undead what the hell is that you know i mean undead and so it's perfectly gothic because it's both and i mean that's the, that's the brilliant logic of the gothic is this fluidity you see it in gender fluidity um, the most recent Dracula, I mean, um, Netflix series and so Oh on. yeah, the BBC one. <laughs> I haven't, you know, I saw it, I turned it on, I'm like, yeah, there's lots of episodes. I don't have the time. I've got to work on a book on Dracula. So, um, uh, but this fluidity and it's, you know, this rejection of either or, you know, either you're alive or you're dead, either you're male or female. So no, that's thrown out the window in a in an intriguing way and i think that's a part of the heart of the gothic is that attraction of the both and sure i mean i i i can definitely see that and to this i mean not to belabor a point on dracula but um Har harker observes of him that he thinks he must be practicing being in the box oh yeah no he's not harping it's good well, I just it just is you know coming to my brain. Yeah. Um, it's funny because most people don't like that first quarter of the book. Um oh. because I mean it was its own book at one time, right? But then it just uh it, it evolved into this larger thing. Um so let's see. Uh let me ask you a more broad question about sort of like your research here. What drew you in toward Poe uh as the exploration point of this topic? Um, mm -hmm. mostly because you, you tend to, as you've already sort of pointed out the idea of like Southern Gothic, we, we do, I think generally think of Gothic being a, a continental European British literary construct more so than an American concept as well. Yes. So I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about what different distinctions and moves led you to where you are. Yeah. So, I mean, as I said at the beginning, this is where I am in the syllabus of the of the senior <laughs> seminar um which i didn't plan this um but so i got interested in poe and uh in uh, most recently working backwards from stoker so stoker is late right 1897 and but he keeps being the novel and his work keeps getting talked about in terms of the gothic so I'm doing this excavation, to use all these metaphors of digging there, um, uh, to try to get at the Gothic so I can get my hands on that, so I can talk about it with some sort of, um, some sort of something. And so, I mean, the first day of class uh, in August, uh, a student, um, I'll call her Anastasia, uh, asked me, what is the Gothic? I was like, okay, let's spend the semester trying to answer that. Let's bring in the expert, Jerry Hogel. He'll come in and try to tell us. So, I mean, because the gothos always seem to me to be an, a, a slippery adjective. And so, uh, I mean, I knew goth 
people in high school, right? When the earth was still cooling in the 70s. Um, you know, I mean, Alice Cooper, uh, you know, and then the damned and my life with the thrill killed cult. And I mean, we, you know, we could keep going. I mean, you could even say the Cocteau twins are goth. But um, <laughs> did I do that too fast? Um, That's fine. He, um, so so I, I went backwards from Stoker trying to get at, so you, you know, everybody tells you, you go back to the castle of Otranto. You got to start with Walpole because in when he, did the second edition of Castle of Otranto, he, he came clean. You know, the first time, the first edition, it was this manuscript unearthed from, I guess, the 14th century, which is this great romantic um, goth desire, right? We want the castles, we want the good old days. We don't want modern science, we want the ruined castles and so on. And in fact, Walpole, you know, um, builds this castle that's, you know, trying to look like it's old and so on um so yeah and so the second edition is called a gothic story and apparently that's the first time that adjective is used in these terms to go back to the goths and the you know the good old days when you know men were like annihilating christians or however you know and it's all mixed up i mean it's both and there's a t there's a bunch of Christianity in the in in the Gothic, and you know it it's raised up and brought down, and it's pain and pleasure, and you know it's both and, and that I think is is what's so part of what's so attractive about about Goth, and boy is it in blossom in October. I think it's I mean it, it's interesting because there's a, the the other big sort of like inversion point of this that is very famous would be Frankenstein right the the idea of like you asked like the the, the contradiction of the undead Frankenstein is sort of undead right he's composed of corpses nice. and then he has this birthing scene if you actually read the text of the book oh, and yeah. so and then you you have this rejection of normalcy uh, in terms of gender roles because Victor Frankenstein becomes very feminine always fainting right always collapsing because he's become a mother. We're gonna and do so, we're gonna do this when we say feminine. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. For, for the right. time period, he assumes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I, I think he's even revived with smelling salts at one time. <laughs> that are then thrown over the salt soldiers. Sure, soldiers. Oh, <laughs> but I mean, in terms of like what you were talking about, like with your dog and everything too. I mean, it's this. It's almost like this blasphemy in the undoing of your your thesis here and the the idea of like a live person being returned this is a dead person now being brought into the world of the living yes yes that's terrifying but but again it's not true right it's not possible it's never no happened. no i mean i mean you know we're getting there maybe but but it would not be the same you would no no to, yeah but they would have been fascinated with that because of like the leftovers from the enlightenment and like making frogs jump by electrifying yeah. and things. Right. And that's in, that's in premature burial. They, yeah. they have a battery that they, they work and it's in the Corman film too. So that's, a battery that's that tries to jolt. That, that's kind of where my, cause I, I was reading uh, recently too, that there was actually a, uh, they were going to do this to George Washington. This is what his physician proposed. He was going to try to reanimate George Washington. Oh, there's got to be a horror story about it. There's got to be. Isn't there something? I, 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 I mean, we were talking person? last night about George Washington as a cannibal, but... Uh, oh, yeah, that'll count. That's that's good enough. But yeah, like that, that was an actual pseudoscientific thing that was proposed at the time. Mesmerism. Mesmerism. That was huge, too. But that was, I mean, the whole deal back then, right? It was like the, the Club Enfer... Uh, and uh, also sort of like in Victorianism when they had like the, uh, what was it called? Phantasmagoria show where they, they would do necromancy on stage because mm -hmm. there was just that deep fascination of bringing death back to life and bringing it out into the world. So it, it was sort of flowing both ways. And uh, with those um, shows, you get the magic lantern and soon the film. And that mm -hmm. is, I mean, that's undead. And then the connection, right? I'm not the first to talk about the connection between cinema and vampires because they live on. I mean, as long as we can, as long as we can preserve those films and, you know, film loved vampires from the beginning. 
um, because you could do the magic things that vampires could do with film. Um, I, you know, I just think of that undercranked, sped up moment in uh, in the Murnau's Nosferatu where he's loading up those coffins yeah. of dirt. It's spectacular. It's frightening. Have you seen um, Shadow of the Vampire? I have. Okay, that's the same, right? Because that's his obsession, right? He wants to be remembered on film. Apart from wanting to eat the woman, he wants to be remembered on film. That's why he agrees to do it. And it's so weird to think, like, you're already immortal, but you want to be extra immortal just in case. (laughs) And Coppola uses that in his, uh, you know, illegally named Bram Stoker's Dracula. But uh, right where um, uh, a very young Dracula walks into London and we hear Mm -hmm. the flicker and it's... um, it's, and, and we see, I think we're seeing um, uh, some very early 1897 um, uh, uh, film. Uh, the, the director is, is escaping me right now. But I think, yeah, in, I think in the, in the cinema, uh, cinematographer where they go and uh, yeah, the yeah. wolf appear. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it's such a weird scene, too. Actually, because uh, you brought Deleuze, um, in my mind, actually, that scene is the best example of um, a crystal image. Uh, because you do get the scene is reflected in a mirror and is reflected in uh, what's going on in the projected film at the same time. So, is uh, it uh, like a vertigo? Uh, it's it's even better. It's three, <laughs> so it's even more crystalline. <laughs> I'll have so, to go back and, and look at that part. Um, that that's a very obscure reference if you're not familiar with Deleuze, but <laughs> it's uh, definitely one of those big film concepts. Um, so yeah, I want to thank you for coming on. I definitely want to thank you for putting up with the, uh, thing on the wing of the plane, uh, (laughs) I felt buried. I was like buried. I couldn't get out to my audience of however many, uh, yes. Um, no, it was great, Matthew. And thank you so much for inviting me. My my great pleasure. I want to encourage everybody. Uh, we're putting a survey, uh, for Humanities Nebraska and Nebraska Art Council in the chat. Uh, so if you would please take that. Uh, I want to remind you to tune in tomorrow night for Kevin Wetmore and hopefully uh, no gremlins. And again, I want to give a very special thank you to William McBride for putting up with the, uh, the various techno- technological challenges. See, this is the problem. You're going to talk about something ancient and it re- modernity came in and started messing <laughs> well, with I, it. Well, I, I encourage uh, folks to check out the program. There are some great, great speakers coming up. It's a great it's a great series you put together, Matthew. You thank and you, Juan. Sir. Thank you so much. And uh, to all of you, stay stay in touch. Yes, sir. Have a good night, everyone. Goodbye. Siri keeps talking at me. It's kind of funny. (laughs) I was getting ready to leave the meeting, but maybe I shouldn't. Oh, no, no. We we, we do this, uh, as you observed last night, this, uh, this, as I said, Brechtian thing. Yeah, let me bring the Cocteau Twins poster up. You see that? I do. Okay. That's enormous. Yeah. <laughs> I took a picture of it and put it on a Cocteau Twins Facebook page and I got I got offers to buy it. Um, uh, it's a promo from a record store. And I had a friend working in a record store who gave it to me. Fair enough. One, I don't see the credits going. There they go. <laughs> I would think. Yeah, I was, it, it was, my, my, my computer is just being a pain, I think. I, I, I don't know. It's been, it's been an adventure this evening. It's been a day. It has, it, it has definitely been. Uh, <laughs> well, you'll remember me particularly. Or, yeah, Mercury is in retrograde, I'm, I'm reminded. So <laughs> per, perhaps that's what's going on. But yeah, and thank you for uh, the shout out. I hope you're able to attend some of the other people uh, as well. Uh, it's it's definitely a, a huge lineup for us this year. It's spectacular. I mean, you've got, you know, I was a little um, uh, cowed having to follow Richard Chismar. You know, I mean, I'm not promoting a New York Times bestseller, uh, but it, I, I felt I felt that was in good company, so I appreciate it.